Hi, this is Jason Baker, and welcome to our weekly DevOps and Cloud Infrastructure Lecture. This week, our topic is going to be Infrastructure as Code. Let's take a moment to look at the agenda for this week's lecture. First, I'll talk about Infrastructure as Code, what it means, and some of the common practices associated with infrastructure as code. Then I'll talk about dynamic infrastructure platforms and infrastructure definition tools and how we can use these tools and platforms to dynamically create and manage our infrastructure. I'll give you a quick primer on both JSON and YAML data file formats. And then finally, the, the bulk of the lecture is going to be focused on a, an AWS technology called AWS Cloud Formation. Okay, let's dive in. So what is infrastructure as code? This is a, a phrase that you've heard many times uh, this semester. And you you've, may have already read about infrastructure as code in your assigned readings. Well, basically infrastructure as code allows us to automate the creation and management of infrastructure in the same way we build software applications. So we we can it's it's really this approach to infrastructure automation which is based on the same practices that we use when we're developing software. So we're using things like version control systems, we're using automated code testing platforms, we're using continuous integration and infrastructure pipelines. All those same practices that we follow when we're, when we're building our software applications, we follow those same practices when building infrastructure. And that's because we're literally defining our infrastructure using code, using essentially like scripts, code scripts. And because we're, we're using code, we can check that code into source control. We can, we can create automated testing to, to test that code. And we can create infrastructure pipelines in a continuous integration system. When we're implementing infrastructure as code, generally we're following a, a number of common principles. The, the idea with infrastructure as code is that we can, we can reproduce our infrastructure systems just like we reproduce our, our software builds. When we're building software as part of a, a software build pipeline, the the pipeline creates a set of artifacts and those artifacts represent like a compiled binary for our application. We can, we can throw away that binary file at any time because we can always reproduce that software build. The same is true of our infrastructure. Our, our infrastructure code generates infrastructure resources like AWS resources. And we can terminate those resources, throw them away at any time because it's always possible for us to recreate our infrastructure from scratch using our infrastructure as code. And because we can always recreate our infrastructure, that means that we can begin to treat our infrastructure and resources as as disposable resources. We can throw them away at any time. We, in other words, we want to treat things like our EC2 instances as cattle, not pets. The idea is that cattle, well, you know, cattle we, 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 we terminate uh, versus our pets, well, our, our pets we if they get sick, we try to nurse them back to health and we, we care for them, we give them names and so on. The, the, the other big benefit 
and the common principle of infrastructure as code is that when we're when we're deploying infrastructure as code, our goal is is to is to maintain consistency as much as possible. If we're deploying a fleet of EC2 instances, we try to ensure that those instances are using the same OS and distribution. They've got the same set of packages that they're configured the same way. Consistency is is absolutely key. And infrastructure as code helps us to guarantee that systems are consistent. Because you could imagine like if you had individual engineers that were configuring different servers, then one server might be configured slightly differently than another server. Even if the two engineers were following the same list of steps during the configuration process, there's because we're humans, we, we would simply you know make errors and introduce errors o- over time. Whereas systems and infrastructure that's built using code is always very consistent. It's always very reproducible. Infrastructure as code embraces the idea that infrastructure will always need to change. And we can make changes to infrastructure just by modifying and making tweaks to our infrastructure code. We use we use our infrastructure definitions and we use our server configuration uh, tools to support all of these concepts. So there are tools out there like AWS Cloud Stack, which we'll learn about in this lecture, Terraform, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, and Salt, which are configuration management tools. These sorts of tools allow us to define infrastructure as code. I mentioned this this whole cattle versus pets analogy, and and this is a famous analogy in in the DevOps space. And the the idea is that traditionally we would we would treat all of our servers as pets. We would carefully handcraft each each server, and we would update each server, and meticulously apply server updates and security patches, and go through testing and if the server broke down then we would you know scramble to try to fix it and figure out what's going on so every server was a was a pet and eventually became a snowflake right the, the idea of the snowflake is that this is a server in the corner that nobody wants to touch because some contractor 3 years ago built it and nobody nobody really knows exactly how it was configured and how how it works and so you know, everyone's af- afraid to touch it because it's it's so brittle. C- cattle, on the other hand, if we treat our servers like cattle, well, when we're done using the server, we just simply terminate it. And instead of nursing it back to health, we essentially shoot it in the head. We And we get rid of it and we replace it with a brand new EC2 instance. Well, how do you know if you're treating your servers in your organization like like pets versus cattle well i have a there, there's a couple ways I, I i can easily tell if, a, if an organization has pets i look at the way that an organization names their resources particular their servers you'll go into some organizations and they give their servers fancy names they name them after Greek gods or planets in the solar system, comic book characters, and so on. And I, I, I have seen all of these different server naming patterns. So instead of naming the server after, you know, giving it a generic name based on some function, like web one, web two, web three, etc. If your organization is actually giving servers sort of real names, then that's an indication that your organization has pets. If you have a server that stays running for months or even years, that could be an indication that you've got a pet. I remember it used to be the case that that you'd have 
companies touting the fact that they've they've had some server running in the back room for like the last six years and no one's ever had to reboot it. And you know they 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 system administrators uh, looked at the, looked at server uptime as like a badge of honor. Well, th- that's uh, that's a pretty clear indication in my mind that we have a pet in the organization. And and you know the this idea that we need to keep the server up and running uh, as long as possible. Uh, suggests to me that that's that server might be a single point of failure within the organization it's probably becoming riskier and riskier to run and manage by the day and and those days are are long gone because we can we can now spin up infrastructure uh, in in minutes and we can create auto scaling groups we can distribute requests across multiple systems using load balancers there's no reason for us to have these very long running servers anymore in our infrastructure if if a server in your organization breaks down do people race to try to nurse it back to health instead of just simply you know terminating the server and spinning up a new one if uh, if people are are scrambling to try to fix a server, that's a pretty good indication that it's a it's a pet. If people are afraid to replace the server, it's be, if it's become this proverbial snowflake system, then it's it's an obvious pet. In some organizations, they have what I call pet cows, in in the sense that they have adopted a naming scheme which is based on some generic id number but yet the systems are not fully automated from a configuration standpoint they the systems you you, you'll see the organization they'll they'll spin up the infrastructure and then they'll manually apply some configuration to each instance so they're sort of acting as if they're dealing with cattle, but in reality, these these servers are still pets. Now now they've become pet cows. So, um, what are some of the common infrastructure as code practices? Well, the first thing is that when we're creating resources using infrastructure as code, we start with some sort of code definition file. And the definition file is used to specify all the different infrastructure resources and how they are to be configured. The infrastructure definition file could be created in something like JSON or YAML or XML, which we'll we'll learn about JSON and YAML later on in this lecture. Or it could be created using some sort of domain-specific language, what we call a DSL. This is a domain specific language kind of looks like a real programming language. And generally it's actually built on top of a real programming language like Python or Ruby or something else. But it's generally much simpler to to use than than a, like a real programming language. And, and it's sort of like a programming language for creating infrastructure. And I mentioned this earlier, because we're using these these code files, that means that we're, in a sense, we're actually self-documenting. One of the big challenges that you have in an organization is trying to understand how your infrastructure is configured. And you see people creating things like Visio diagrams, and they're maintaining documentation and systems like Confluence and so on. Well, if, 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 with, if you're using infrastructure as code and you want to understand how your infrastructure is configured, all you need to do is look at the code files. And that gives you really a perfect understanding of exactly how your infrastructure is configured. 
because we're writing everything in these code files, that means we can commit our code into something like a Git repository. We can essentially version our infrastructure, which it's which is really an amazing thing because over time we've you know we're always making changes to our infrastructure, and it's it's nice to have this traceability and we can sort of trace our current infrastructure resources back to our code repository and see a timeline of changes. And we'll know exactly what changed and who, who made the change uh, to, our, to our infrastructure over time. It also allows us to revert our infrastructure. If we need to roll back a change that was made, we can do that by just simply uh, reverting back to a previous commit in uh, our Git repository. And the, the visibility that this affords is, is tremendous because now our infrastructure configuration is visible to anybody who has access to the, the Git repository. And then finally, it, it's really common for us when we're working with infrastructure as code to set up some sort of automated testing around our infrastructure definition files. The idea is that every single time we make a change to our infrastructure definition, instead of applying that change immediately to like our production environment, we could actually deploy a test environment. We could stand up a brand new environment and apply our changes to that new environment and then run a series of automated tests against that environment to see if that infrastructure change did what we expected it to do. And we can build this whole process into infrastructure pipelines on our uh, continuous integration system. I'm gonna take a, a brief aside here and, and talk about a concept called anti-fragility and this, this, and, uh, and then we'll talk about how infrastructure as code really plays an important role in this anti-fragility process. So, IT has has always been really focused on building reliable infrastructure. If you recall back to the previous lecture, your IT operations team, you know, the 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 way that they're measured in terms of their success is oftentimes based on reliability. It's based on service uptime. And so as, as an IT operations professional, we're always, respons we're always responsible and we're focused on, on building super reliable infrastructure. And that's, that's always a challenge, right? Because oftentimes in IT, we're not actually building the applications or, or at least we have one, one team within our IT organization, the development team, which is building the application, and then the operations team is uh, oftentimes responsible, though not solely responsible, as you've learned, for the, the ongoing maintenance and uh, the support of that application. And applications can fail in, in many, many different ways, very unexpected ways. So we can use infrastructure as code to help us help us make our software and our infrastructure anti-fragile. The idea is that uh, anti-fragile is like exercising. When we exercise, you know, you go to the gym and you're exercising, you might be lifting weights the the act of exercising actually damages your muscles and after you're, after exercising then you will uh, relax and you know take a couple days off from exercise and during that time your muscles will actually heal and it's the healing of your muscles that that is what actually makes them stronger. So you're actually breaking down your muscles and then you're allowing them to heal and in the process they get stronger. Well, traditionally in our IT organizations, 
we would try to prevent change. You know, we would uh, minimize the amount of change which was which was happening because we were always concerned that introducing change meant that we were introducing risk, which is which is true. Um, and we weren't in a good position to really manage that risk. So, and essentially, you can think of it like this: in our traditional organ, uh, IT organizations, preventing change was like not exercising. We weren't because, and because we were preventing change when we weren't exercising, we were not giving our infrastructure and our application the opportunity to become stronger over time. So with infrastructure's code, we can now begin to make our platform anti-fragile, meaning that we can use infrastructure's code to purposefully make changes to our infrastructure and break it. And by breaking it and, and then fixing it over time, we are actually exercising that infrastructure and ultimately making it stronger, more robust, more reliable, more fault tolerant. The, the large uh, streaming provider, Netflix, has really pioneered this concept over time, which they call chaos engineering. And they built two different well, they built several different tools, but two of them I highlight in this presentation are Chaos Monkey and Chaos Kong. The, their Chaos Monkey application, what, what it does is it randomly terminates production EC2 instances running on Netflix's platform. So and I didn't say I didn't say this is a development environment or a test environment production environment. So Netflix has this tool that just randomly goes out and kills its production instances. And your first at first blush you're like that sounds absolutely crazy. If I if I told our senior IT leadership that we were going to be randomly blowing away our production servers at all times of the day, they would think I'm absolutely crazy. Um, but the reality is that companies like Netflix have designed their platforms to be very resilient and to be able to withstand the loss of something like a single EC2 instance. So the Chaos Monkey tool is actually introducing a source of change and risk into that environment. It's purposely breaking that environment. And I'm sure early on when they were running the, running the tool, they, they found applications and processes which broke because of it. But then the engineers at Netflix learned how to fix those failure modes and, and make their platform and application more resilient so that over time, as Chaos Monkey was killing off its, its servers, uh, those actions had, had no impact anymore. So their application actually became stronger and more resilient over time because it was being exercised. The resources were being broken and then they were figuring out how to heal them. Chaos Kong will, instead of terminating an entire, uh, instead of terminating an EC2 instance, it will uh, terminate an entire availability zone. And I think they also have a tool that'll terminate an entire region so that they can test the, you know, what, what happens if they, if, if AWS loses, loses an entire availability zone, what happens if AWS loses an entire region? So this, this whole idea behind chaos engineering is that today organizations are building these very large scale distributed systems and oftentimes they're built on this concept of microservices where instead of building this one big uh, this this sort of one big monolithic application 
we're, we're building an application using 50 different microservices. And, and, and because we're, we have now 50 different applications all kind of working in unison and coordinating and collaborating with one another, it becomes very, very complex. And these sort of complex systems tend to fail in unpredictable ways. It used to be the case that in software engineering that we could kind of sit down as a team and we could we could sort of itemize all of the different possible failure scenarios for our application. Uh, it becomes very, very difficult to do that though as the number of applications increases exponentially. It's easy to do it for say one or a handful of applications, but if you, your typical microservices application could have 40 different services uh, involved. So the, the way that our platforms failed is now becoming much more unpredictable. And this whole idea of chaos engineering, the, this practice, it, its goal is to identify the weaknesses that are these that are found in these very complex systems and and there's all kinds of different weaknesses that uh, that can surface you might have a system that has improper fallback settings if one of the services becomes unavailable you could have these retry storms if uh, if if a, a core service disappears and a bunch of other services are depending on it those services could begin trying to retry their connections to that service and and if they're all trying to, re to retry at the same time that could could generally generate almost like a denial of service sort of attack you might have uh, outages that occur when there's downstream uh, dependencies that are overloaded you could you could have cascading failures where the, the loss of a couple services leads to the cascading failure in, in other services in the platform. It's, it's very, very difficult, as I mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to, uh, to be able to d describe these sort of failure modes in advance and predict these failure modes. So, the, the way we do it is, is by using chaos engineering techniques like uh, the Netflix chaos monkey tool where we, in our platform, we actually inject change into it. We, in, we purposefully inject random failures into the platform so that we can begin to understand some of these complex failure situations. And then over time, as we're exercising the platform, it becomes more and more resilient. Another um, another idea related to this this uh, um, to this chaos engineering is is what we call intuition engineering. And as I mentioned, our our platforms today are becoming more and more complex because they're they're distributed platforms comprised of dozens, maybe even hundreds of, of services at times. And the, the platform can at some point become so large and so complex that it's not possible for a, a, a one engineer to understand how everything works. And that was the case at, at Netflix where, it, you know, it, it they got they they are they are so big and their platform is so complex, it's not possible for them to really test uh, everything in in a test environment, right? Uh, so because they're dealing with literally millions of EC2 instances, there are some things that they can only test in production, and they've created a set of tools to help their engineers kind of understand the state of their of their services. The idea is that an engineer should be able to look at some instrumentation and be able to sort of use intuition to understand if the platform is operating properly. And here's a here's a, a, a video of a tool called Visceral uh, 
that was developed at uh, at Netflix. And the idea is that this is showing traffic flowing between multiple AWS regions, and and they're going to simulate the failure of one of those regions. And and so an engineer could be looking at this this uh, this uh, this uh, you know simulation and and they could see what is going on in real time in their traffic in real time uh, in in the network and you can so you can clearly see that something is going on that traffic is now being shed uh, from one uh, from one region and it's transitioning over to another region. So that region has just failed, and now the traffic is being handled by the other two regions. So th this, again, because the platform is so complex and it's so large that it's not possible to just lo look at a handful of data points to understand what is going on. So this is providing, this tool is providing a much broader perspective, sort of a global perspective on the health of the given of a given service.